Hey everybody, Benny in the Shed here. Um, I'm going to do a, uh, a bit of a blurb about my uh, One How Duplicator 7 or D7 uh, resin printer. Um, mainly because uh, I've overcome a lot of problems with it um, and also had some pretty good results. The uh, interesting thing is that, uh, you know, you've if you've been 3D printing for a long time, which I have, uh, then going into the resin printing side of things gives you uh, a whole new learning curve. And uh, what I've done uh, early on, when I got interested in the D7, was to join the uh, One Hour D7 Facebook group. And I have to say, smartest move ever. Uh, those guys have really helped me out. And um, you get answers to questions very quickly uh, off that group and also you get to see a lot of people's work which is which is very important because um, then you know what the machine's capable of and you can uh, hopefully get similar results yourself it can be quite frustrating getting those fantastic results but um, it's worth persisting okay so here's our subject this is the one how um, duplicator 7 um, just quickly to go over the component parts here, uh, we've got the uh, build platform, which is on this uh, vertical lead screw. Um, that detaches, and that's how you service the printer, really, um, taking to get your print off. Uh, down here, is the resin vat which attaches with these two uh, screws and how thrilling watching me unscrew these thumb screws and resin vat comes off so the interesting thing about the resin vat is that it has this plastic film which you can hear is tight as a drum skin. Now, I was worried about replacing this uh, FEP film, uh, but it is actually quite simple to do. Um, you know, provided you take some uh, uh, some time and uh, and just do it gradually. There's a lot of screws in here, um, but uh, there's a little video um, on replacing this uh, this film. I'll link to that. In the in the description. Okay, so um, the other things worthy of mention here uh, is this here, which is the LCD screen, and um, then uh, back here. I don't know if you can see. Here's the uh, sensor for the vertical Z axis. So the vertical axis uses this as a uh, uh, as a sensor to set the height here. So um, essentially, to set the machine up, uh, you need to uh, zero the height. So that's achieved by uh, loosening off these four fasteners and two on the other side and uh, that will then leave the the build plate loose and um, then you can go ahead and uh, use the zero um, function or the home function to set the the uh, bed height and uh, once that's achieved that um, uh, that vertical height um, with respect to the sensor uh, what you'll have then is this loose build plate sitting on top of the FEP film at that point you um, screw the screws in tight um, it's a good idea to hold a little bit of pressure on the plate while you screw the screws in not too much just uh, enough to make sure that it's sitting flat on the FEP and that's it you're done then uh, that's that's the machine uh, calibrated and um, good to go. Uh, I should mention that this is the 1.4 version of this machine. 
I was fortunate enough when I ordered that the 1.4 machine was the only uh, machine that was shipping at that time. Um, didn't accidentally get a 1.3 or an earlier version. And uh, it's probably worthwhile going over those uh, changes now. Um, primarily, uh, what you got on the, on the 1.4 machine uh, was just down here, this flexible coupler. Uh, on previous machines it was a solid coupler and that was contributing to z-axis wobble on the printer um, and the z-axis wobble tends to become visible in the print uh, as uh, um, surface distortion so if you had a nice clean curve uh, if you've got z-axis wobble in the machine then that clean curve is going to come out with little ridges and so forth on it. Um, there's plenty of examples of, of uh, uh, z-axis wobble. Um, people have photographed uh, their work on, uh, on the Facebook group. So I, if you're going to get one of these machines, join the group first, um, get a feel for it, ask some questions on there. Uh, you know, as I said, you'll probably get an answer pretty quickly. Um, the other feature of this machine is this the uh, stabilizer um, and I've talked to a few people about this and there's a fair bit of debate about whether it should be left on the machine or not because that also can contribute to z-axis wobble if this lead screw here is not straight so um, I've taken the time and trouble to straighten this lead screw now when I was setting the machine up um, I actually never tried to use a computer as the source uh, for this machine. I, I went with the Raspberry Pi option and uh, the Nano DLP software uh, from the get-go because I could see that was the most sensible way to do this. Um, if you run this off a computer as uh, an additional screen, which is what you do, you set this up as an additional screen on a PC, uh, then uh, you have to make absolutely certain you've got no screen savers turned on, you've got no uh, uh, sleep function set on and so forth and so on. It just seemed to me that you're just opening yourself up to a big lot of uh, issues um, early on when you know what you really need to be doing is calibrating your machine to, to the resin that you're using and so forth and uh, uh, just seemed to me to be the most sensible way to go with the Raspberry Pi. Uh, now there's plenty of instructional material on uh, YouTube for you to get that set up. Uh, it can be a bit of a hassle but I'll put a link to uh, what I found worked the best which is the Easy Start page um, that's uh, connected to the um, Nano DLP uh, GitHub site. Alright so um, that's the, the bones of the machine, uh, or the, the basics of it. Uh, now, problems that I had, right. Um, so, early on I took the stabiliser off the machine, um, because uh, for better or worse, I bought this machine to do a specific job, um, which was a pretty heavy duty um, bit of uh, printing. and. Um, hopefully when this video is produced I'll be able to show you what I made because they are uh, trophies for an award ceremony which hasn't been run yet so um, I'm not actually free to show you what I made on the, on the printer um, but uh, if when I publish this video if it's, if it's past the 29th of September um, I'll be able to show you those, uh, those items that I printed on here and believe me I took this machine as far as it could possibly go. Maximum vertical height, maximum volume, volume in, in the, uh, in the, in the uh, print capacity, um, such that I actually had to top up the resin while the machine was, uh, was running uh, to make sure that it wouldn't run out of resin while it was printing what I was printing on this machine. Um, so I have to say, that was printed out of the out of the box. Those those items were printed out of the box, and um, this machine performed admirably for for uh, the.
price point that it's at and uh, so I mean I've got to say wow really for for the cost um, amazing that that I got that job out which was 14 separate items uh, and uh, yeah amazing anyway um, but I did have some some issues and I'll, I'll go over those now alright so one of the issues that I had um, and I tend to think that the demand for these machines is probably fairly high um, so they're you know pretty much knocking them out as fast as possible which I don't blame them for um, when you've got a commercial imperative like that it's quite a good idea to try and satisfy the market lest you have a competitor come in and do it for you so what we'll do here is I'll take this front cover off and and just detail to you um, the issues that I had and fortunately they weren't um, the the problem that I had was with the screen and uh, it wasn't it didn't end up being a you know a killer um, it ruined a few prints. Um, I used up a lot of resin uh, on, on, on dud prints um, for various reasons, not just this reason. Um, but, uh, you know, as I, um, uh, you know, continued um, the job with this, you know, it, it was one of the issues that cropped up. Okay, so what we're talking about is this this ribbon cable here's the LCD cable that does this magnificent curl here and, and I've tried so hard not to uh, disturb that because uh, that's that's super interesting um, and uh, but it was this cable here this one with this blue edge to it now as you can see now that's fairly straight those two lines are re relatively parallel. The edge of, of this connector clamp and that blue tape that's going across there, pretty much straight. Um, when I opened this up the first time, this was cocked over. And that contributed to the problems I was having. And I'll, I'll uh, post up a still image uh, of, the, uh, of the problem I was having uh, right at this point. Now the other end of this cable I didn't, I didn't do anything to because I don't want to disturb any of this, um, of this stuff. I don't want to disturb that in particular. I don't know how that connector opens and I, I don't want to find out. I found the problem so I just fixed it and that was the end of that. Okay, so while we're, now, while it, while we're inside the machine here, um, there's two other known problems <laughs> well two two known problems they're the same problem because it's the same component when that when that fan quits the the LED light source overheats and fails so um, I'm in the process of ordering some ball bearing fans to replace these with. They're a standard size, so it's not a, not a big drama. Um, easily addressed, um, but you can see already that you know there's a, f a reasonable amount of um, of disassembly that's going to have to take place uh, to get those out. So, uh, or get that one out. There's another one over here, um, same diameter. This one's noisy as well, so. Um, you know, <laughs> at least they're consistent. Uh, all right, so that's that's how I've uh, um, I've addressed that issue with the uh, with the screen, um, and also I've noticed that these covers uh, are a little bit uh, inaccurate um, in as much as where the fasteners. Um, come up here uh, so where these fasteners center is not very accurate and um, 
and so what I do with just about everything and I just do this as a, as a matter of course um, you know I'll actually pop the fasteners in and leave them a little bit loose on both sides and this just saves any any potential cross threading or anything like that um, it's you know steel into aluminium so you cross thread these and, and uh, you know you'll get a nicely mangled thread um, that's already twisted there uh, I know my, my arm's in the way sorry about that that's it okay so we got those in loosely now I'll go through and, and tighten these up um, and then I'll tighten up the base plate ones as well yeah. it's not bad value this machine for for what you're getting um, the potential uh, to make highly accurate models um, and uh, out of a range of materials as well uh, resins as well uh, uh, most of the resin manufacturers seem to have got on board with uh, this type of printer um, uh, you know if you're not aware the um, SLA printers or the resin printers that were uh, common um, like form labs and, and so forth you know they actually use an ultraviolet laser to harden the resin whereas these machines use a projected image so basically what happens is the inside the tank um, so you've got this perimeter here this is the LCD screen each layer of the print is an image and and that projects in into the resin the ultraviolet light source is underneath the LCD screen when the screens black then there's uh, no ultraviolet light getting through to the resin and then when you put an image in there which is a monochrome image uh, the print is actually what's going to print is positive so it comes up as a pattern here that you can see and and that's one of the things that you that you should do prior to putting resin into your machine prior to um, uh, doing your first print um, you really should leave the build plate off set set a print running and check to see that your screen is working properly so that you're getting a nice crisp clean image uh, in the uh, on the LCD screen and uh, you know then you'll know that the machines operating correctly all right so, so what I've done to this to this machine um, from a sort of troubleshooting perspective is uh, as I showed you that connector and what I also did was I when I was printing all those items for the uh, awards I actually um, had this stabilizer removed from the machine uh, I've since reinstalled it and I've reinstalled it because I um, I've trued up this this rod here now when I was setting this machine up and and I was doing some uh, manual jogging on the machine I was raising and lowering the uh, the the platform here um, this was still installed and I did manage to crash the um, the platform bracket here into this uh, which um, would have put some strain on the uh, on the lead screw these are quite easy to bend um, I didn't think they, they would be easy to bend but they are quite easy to bend so um, 
what actually happened what I think I if it wasn't bent before it was definitely bent after I did that so I took this apart so that I would not uh, run into the z-axis wobble problem because that was going to cause some real problems with the printing I was doing okay so um, getting this apart is relatively easy and if I've got one piece of advice to you I'd say have plenty of paper towel <laughs> available at all times <clears throat> especially when you when you're uh, dealing with prints I'm not um, not sure how familiar you all are with with linear bearings and uh, and that type of, of mechanical device but um, this machine's got uh, a type of linear rail in it which uses some I'll see if I can get a shot down the end of this so it's got this aluminium extrusion or aluminium extrusion if you like um, and it's got these steel rods pressed into the sides of it and then the truck that goes on there to provide the movement has these little groove bearings on there and this third one has got an eccentric adjuster on it um, so fortunately the way mine's uh, been assembled from the factory this is a good fit this is a really good fit it doesn't it doesn't um, wobble at all so that's a good fit and um, I know people have had issues with uh, with the rail uh, not being even um, and I've just I've had this myself I've actually bought some of this material for another job um, and uh, that's one of the things I discovered about it was that um, the uh, consistency of the distance between the rails isn't great um, and all things considered this this type of rail isn't made for a, a really precision um, uh, machine or whatever it's a budget thing um, when I bought some of this stuff it was actually uh, classified as uh, lift door rail so this was this is a rail a, a, a linear rail for a, a lift door mechanism to operate in you know so that the the doors slide backwards and forwards and uh, so not super precision so if you're tuning your machine mechanically one of the things you can do is what I've just done take the lead screw out uh, it's not difficult just it just clamps into the uh, into there into the flexible coupling and then reinstall your your uh, um, truck and platform and just let the thing roll up and down and what you're looking for is tight spots or if uh, you know there's any imp impediment to uh, you know free and smooth movement now um, that feels pretty good to me so uh, that definitely is um, good for the job so what I'll do next is show you as best as I can how I trued up the lead screw and I'm gonna to have to set up a couple of things to do that so back this is how I um, trued up the screw uh, or the lead screw for my machine I've got a few sheets of glass here all I've got um, in the workshop here for glass is these glass sheets that I had cut for printing ABS on some uh, flash forge creators so I've used a few of those um, if you if you've got a, sh a thicker sheet of glass good for you if not um, if you're going to get some glass to do this job I'd recommend getting something fairly fairly thick um, this is three millimeter 
you know, go for, you know, some, uh, you know, it's like a scrap of plate glass if you can get it or something like that. Anyway, the, the object here is to roll the screw and it actually helps to have a white background um, for this. So you roll the screw and you're looking for a gap appearing between the screw and the glass. So that will then be a high spot. If this has got a, a, a bend in it, then you'll discover the high spot by rolling this. And another, another uh, exercise you can do before you start looking for a high spot is just let the, let the screw roll across the glass. Um, I just uh, fortunately happen to have a non-level table here, so it just rolls on its own. So uh, what you can see there is is it's rolling pretty freely, and there isn't any any sort of um, uh, real sort of gadunk 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 kind of thing going on. Okay, so um, that's a good initial test, and, and then uh, then you want to go slowly and find that high spot. And then you need a, a way to uh, correct that. And um, I've got a little setup here, uh, just using a wood chisel. Please forgive me, all you woodwork guys. It's not what I usually do with my chisels. It just fell to hand when I was doing this job. And when you've found the high spot, so you, you've rolled the, the screw over and you've looked at the glass or the gap between the bottom of the screw and the glass and you'll roll it over till you've got the high spot uppermost. Then just use something like this. Um, you don't want something that will mar the thread so this is uh, resin or plastic. Um, then just come along and just press up on both ends and then recheck. Um, now as I said before this this material or this screw will bend fairly easily so don't overdo it. Go just bit by bit you know incrementally to get the, the screw flat um, if you've got that problem. So that's that's the that's the uh, the lead screw um, when we put it back in the in the machine, uh, I found it, it went in better one way than the other. Um, so, uh, and that was to do with the uh, with the stabilizer. So, I want to get that sort of lined up with the top of the machine there. So with the top of that column and tighten that up. Now some guys on the forum have gone to the trouble of um, you know of, of aligning the, the motor down here and, and some other stuff like that. Um, I haven't gone to that extent um, simply because I didn't have time um, before and, and also really uh, you know between each one of these tweaks that you do you really need to test the machine and uh, and I, I haven't put the time into that uh, as it stands so um, uh, the nut here just wind that first nut with the spring on it down to the top of the leads lead screw so it's just about flush and give it a little bit of room and then uh, on with the uh, little truck here or carriage and get that lined up in the process and hopefully you'll then get that and just wind it back and forth a bit make sure that that's free it's not binding inside the nut here and back on with the stabilizer And there we go. Good times. So 
So that's that's pretty much it for for um, for machine related um, troubleshooting and mods, if you like, not real mods, uh, just stuff to get the machine to work um, more as designed. Um, uh, Oh, there's one thing I forgot to mention with the platform here. When I got mine, it had a, uh, a, a ridge along the back here from where it was cut out of uh, sheet metal. And um, I didn't sand this plate because I wasn't sure that, that that was going to be the right thing to do. Um, this powder coat surface has got a little bit of roughness to it and I thought that would probably work. Um, so I gave it the benefit of the doubt and I did all of that printing, which hopefully I'll show you later, um, just on this surface. But all I did was I just smoothed this, uh, this uh, cut edge here, um, mainly so it wouldn't press into the, into the FEP film. So um, that's, that was the only mod that I did to the, the platform itself. Um, so yeah, there you have it. Um, all right. Let's talk essentials um, for resin printing. Now, despite your best efforts, you will get resin everywhere. It'll just happen, you know. Um, even if you're wearing gloves, you'll do something like, you'll take the, the you know, here's a, here's a classic, all right? So, here's me, you know, being the, you know, the most careful that I can. So you'll take the you'll take the the the, the plate off. It's got your print on it. You're so excited. Um, now even even though you're wearing gloves, you know you at this point as soon as you start handling this stuff, you're going to get resin on your gloves. Uh, the next thing is you'll take the print off. Uh, where do you put the the uh, the platform? Well, the smart place to put it would be in a container right away put it in a container uh, a clean one and uh, if it's going to drip let it drip there somewhere along the line you're going to touch something that you would normally be able to touch with bare hands you know parts of your machine that shouldn't have resin on them etc etc forget it you are going to get resin everywhere so just the the only way to sort of combat this problem is to uh, basically clean up after each uh, print and uh, you know if you if you're working with the machine you know if you haven't got gloves on and you touch something and you find it sticky clean it you know that's the best way to, to go about that I think uh, that's what works for me um, if you've got a big enough workshop then you could have like a dedicated wet area but believe me that resin is going to just appear in places that you never you never thought of. Um, on the toxicity of the resin, uh, people get pretty bent out of shape over it because it, it does have an odor to it. Uh, depending on the resin manufacturer, depending on uh, you know um, you know the hardener that's in it and the composition of the resin itself. Yes, it can be pretty stinky. Um, and then you've got you know all this hoodoo around. Oh, it's poisonous! Oh, if it touches your skin, you will die. Uh, no, you won't. Um, some people have a reaction to the resin. It gives them a rash. Uh, if you discover that you're that kind of person, you're going to have to take really special, extra special care of what you do with the resin and where it gets, even though it gets everywhere. So. All right. So here's the here's the 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 best method, um, or the, the best, I guess, routine, is when you've got a print finished and you're coming down to get it off the machine. This should be your first stop. Get some gloves and put them on. All right. Now, um, uh, you know, I've seen thing saying use nitrile gloves blah, blah, blah. yeah great nitrile gloves are more expensive than than these ones which I think are made of vinyl um, but honestly for the short amount of time that you're gonna have these on 
and the fact that you might also discover that in the process of what you're doing you have to take the gloves off chuck them out and put another pair on these ones are a lot cheaper and um, I've had one or two problems with them with them uh, bre getting breached and you know then you get stuff inside fortunately I don't have a reaction to the resin um, I've discovered that by trial and error this is the other thing that you're going to need you're going to need isopropyl alcohol or IPA um, this is a solvent for the resin now I'm told that um, uh, methylated spirits will work as well um, it's easy to get uh, in Australia in particular me uh, methylated spirits whereas this I had to buy from um, an electronic supplier off eBay uh, so it's up to you what you do um, uh, I, I think use the right use the right materials is probably the, the, the best idea um, this was delivered very quickly from uh, Mectronics and uh, so you know I uh, didn't have a, any drama with that as you can see I've used quite a lot I've used more than half uh, the other thing you're going to need and equip yourself with this stuff before you actually start using your machine you're going to need some containers um, just ordinary cheapo um, um, polypropylene containers are fine that's all I'm using here um, and uh, one of the things that I that I did uh, early on with these is I made up a little setup where I can filter the resin or filter the particulates out of the resin uh, my workshop here has got big skylights in it and what I find happens with my resin is oh, my IPA is that I get cured uh, resin inside it uh, and for the for the printing job that I was doing this was not a good thing having these little these little particles uh, of cured resin in here it's amazing you know <laughs> you you dissolve the the resin it dissolves in this in this uh, in this uh, chemical but um, if it's exposed to light uh, it will actually clump together and make little particles in there or in this case these actual sort of little skins so um, I made a, a setup where I could uh, just uh, take that uh, IPA and I made a hole in the top of this then I just get a piece of paper towel and shove it in there this is one of the few useful things I learned in chemistry at school um, how to filter stuff so there I've got that then I can I can pour the the resin into there and it filters through the paper and gets all that all those little particles out um, it takes a little while but uh, but what it means then is that um, uh, you know I'll have a you know my dirty resin or what I classify as my dirty resin uh, will be uh, will be uh, particle free which is what I needed for that job I was doing um, so the ideal setup um, is and I haven't got one at the moment is to have uh, you know three containers um, and I have got three containers so three containers and you go uh, let's call this uh, clean IPA uh, no Bzz. probably best to do it this way around this will work well won't it okay so dirty IPA water dirty IPA water dirty IPA water go through a few times washing your print and then have in the last container some clean IPA and um, once you've rinsed it, uh, uh, washed it a couple of times in the uh, in the in the uh, dirty IPA, you can then uh, um, be pretty assured that your clean IPA you're not going to contaminate that too much. And then after a while, you make the clean IPA into the dirty IPA. You throw the dirty IPA out, and um, you know start you know just rotate the uh, the um, IPA through that way. Another so, thing you'll need is a way to strain your resin. So this is like a 
uh, normal kitchen strainer. You can pick these up in in you know like the cheap shops, you know for you know like ten, you know, it wouldn't even be five bucks maybe. So <clears throat> the mesh on this is pretty fine. I do have another one here, which is a little tea globe thing. You know, you put your tea in here. And it's got a little mechanism that holds that closed, uh, but much, much finer mesh. So if you're looking to get some very fine uh, particle filtration in your resin, then um, you know maybe try and find something like this. I, I meant to split these up, but I just didn't get the chance. I was, you know, when I needed this, I needed to use it right away uh, to keep my production line going and uh, I haven't split those up yet but I will do eventually so uh, that's for straining your red those are both for straining resin um, what can happen with a print is uh, you can get uh, a misprint where you've got cured resin uh, floating around uh, sometimes that can be quite hard particularly if the if the prints detach from the base uh, and maybe some of your um, base cured uh, components in there have broken off you can get nasty little sharp pieces of hard resin which will puncture the or potentially puncture the FEP film in your uh, vat so that this is a, a good idea um, you know if you've if you have a misprint and you can see stuff floating around in the resin then definitely strain it uh, at least with a strainer uh, uh, you know of this mesh size which is probably about sub millimeter, I would say, uh, and this is way uh, finer than that. So um, these are all the tools and bits and pieces. Now, the other thing that's absolutely 100% total essential is paper towel, or uh, some people are uh, using, you know, the folded paper towels that that uh, that uh, you get in dispensers in in uh, uh, bathrooms uh, whatever you need you're going to need some disposable towel what I do before I start working with the resin is I just rip off a whole bunch of these and have them in a stack so as I need them I can just grab them and uh, and um, <clears throat> you know use them as needed um, that noise behind us is the other resin printer that I've got here, which is my Flashforge Hunter, just finishing a little test cube. So we might take a look at that later on. Um, so yes, essentials. The other thing is you want a non-metallic scraper to get your print off the off the machine. Um, and uh, this is the one that came with the printer. It's it's good for the job. It's got kind of a chisel point on it. Uh, which you can see you might may or may not be able to see now that's all sort of messed up um, the the resin when it sticks to the plate does stick quite hard and it is very hard it's it's you know it's flinty hard and um, getting it off will mean damaging that edge this is another thing this is an avocado scoop that I um, uh, saved from the garbage bin that's been quite useful as well for dealing with um, little bits of, of uh, cured resin or semi-cured resin um, that's I think made of Delrin I think uh, either that or, or um, good old uh, nylon so those are things you have to have you know in easy reach once you start working with your print as it comes off the machine uh, so yeah there's uh, no substitute for being prepared when it comes to working with this stuff and this is the the area that I've been uh, processing my prints and so forth in and believe me every time I touch the surface here uh, I can tell it's a little bit sticky I'm gonna need to go over the whole thing with some uh, IPA and and really clean up this whole area um, to ensure that I'm not spreading resin around everywhere so um, what I'll do now is we'll uh, we'll go to some screenshot stuff on the computer and I'll show you uh, nano DLP which I think is is an essential for for working with the okay here we are at the nano DLP homepage 
And one of the great things about Nano DLP is that uh, you communicate with your Raspberry Pi running Nano DLP over your network. And so all you have to do is find out the IP address of your Raspberry Pi and put it into a browser and you're right there. So uh, one of the things I want to talk about early on here is that you really need to get a compatible uh, firmware for the Duplicator 7 and the Raspberry Pi image. So they both need to be compatible. And what I discovered in my journey of trying to get Nano DLP set up was that this firmware and this image work together. Other combinations that I tried did not, and it was very, very frustrating. Um, it's worthwhile uh, watching the videos on this page. I'll put a link in the description uh, to this page, but mark my words, this is the easiest way to get going with Nano DLP. Okay, so back to the Nano DLP page. Uh, this is the, the home page. When you're printing, it will show you an image up here. It'll show you the current image that it's printing. Um, also, you've got some stats down here to uh, show you that your um, that your Raspberry Pi is actually alive, and um, there's plenty of information on this page once you get started doing a print. Probably the two uh, areas you'll be visiting the most will be the uh, resin profiles. So if you download the image that I just showed you, you'll get a whole bunch of these resin profiles as part of the image, um, which uh, depending on where you are in the world and what uh, resins are available to you, uh, this might be uh, really useful. Um, what was useful to me was one of the videos uh, where there was some um, information about using Monocure Rapid Clear Resin, which is pretty much the only resin I've printed with. And as you can see here, I've got a few different profiles here. Uh, the one I'm experimenting with at the moment is this one here, the uh, 50 micron one. And, you know, you'll have to fine tune these. Um, and the best way to do it is to use uh, a calibration cube or something along those lines. So there's the resin profiles. Um, I mentioned to you before with my Z screw that I bent it and I bent it by using these controls here. Now um, these are supposed to move the Z axis to absolute positions. Um, so if you uh, click 10 millimeters twice it'll move the first time but not the second time in theory. Uh, what actually happened to me was I actually moved the uh, z-axis upwards and then in frustration because I wasn't getting what I wanted I clicked one of these other buttons and it moved it uh, right up till it hit the end uh, it hit the stabilizer at the top that I was showing you before and so like I said if the lead screw wasn't bent before that happened then it probably was afterwards so uh, use some caution with this. You will need to use the floor button to do your calibration. Um, I found that one's a safe one to use because the uh, platform drops to the sensor position and the top button is uh, safe to use as well, I discovered. Uh, the others, well, you know, um, you know, you might have uh, different results than I did. Anyway, just use some caution with those buttons. Um, as far as creating a print job goes, that's in the plates menu. Uh, when you want to add a, a model, um, you can just go to the add button, choose the file, uh, go and find it from your, um, 
uh, you know, from your list of uh, downloads or whatever you've got, and uh, go right ahead and load up that model. What I discovered was that the um, if we just choose a file here, um, I'll just use this pickle rick uh, file. I'll submit that. And it start, starts processing. And one of the things I always do before I kick off a print is I click on the layers button to make sure that, um, uh, now this is one of the bugs here, it's not displaying the, the, uh, those layers. Uh, I'll go into here. Um, okay, so I like to go in and check these um, all of the images here in the uh, in the um, layers to make sure that it's within the print volume of the machine and it's oriented the way that I want it to uh, uh, to be. Now the uh, sorry, the pickle rick one that I started processing. Now this is a bug in Nano DLP. If you start at some point, if you start slicing this and um, and you delete it, okay, we'll delete that. We'll go back and add that file again. So we'll add pickle rick again. Now this should be a new plate. All right, <laughs> it shouldn't do that. Ah, no, it's picked up that this is the same uh, file name and it hasn't started processing it from the beginning. It's started somewhere other than that and it's now stopped. It's not processing anymore. So uh, the only way to solve this problem is to reboot the, the, the uh, Raspberry Pi. That's, that's my experience anyway. So... Um, in uh, in this area, in the plates area, you've got a, a 3D view that you can that you can uh, look at, um, and you know I find this quite sort of non-intuitive to use, and um, yeah, it's it's a bit clunky, it's a bit basic. Um, so for preparing my uh, files, I use a um, uh, software put out by FlashForge and I'm very familiar with this one because all the machines I've got are FlashForge machines. So what I'll do is go in here to edit and I will uh, rather print and I'll select the FlashForge Hunter as my machine which is a DLP printer. So uh, what I want to do now is load up my uh, model uh, and so that's in downloads. So I'll just grab the Pickle Rick one again. Okay, so here's Pickle Rick. We put him on the platform. We'll repair him because uh, there obviously seems to be a problem with Pickle Rick. Now, um, what I will do in this program actually is do all my work uh, on the model, scale it, whatever. Uh, also add my supports but the funny thing about this is when uh, this is uh, output it's actually rotated 90 degrees so this is a bit of a pest but um, I'll actually have to rotate this 90 degrees uh, then I'll put my supports on and what I'll do then is I'll actually uh, go back, save the supports to the file, and then I'll go file, save as, uh, and make sure to change this to STL. So change the, um, the uh, file extension here to STL and I'll change also the whole file name and try and fool uh, nano DLP um, 
uh, that I've got um, that I've got a whole new file here. So I'll save that back into the downloads folder. Get rid of that. Uh, we'll choose another file, and we'll just grab that one that I just made and put him in and see what happens. No, <laughs> it's figured it out. <coughs> this is a bit of a loop you get into here and, and you can't get out of it, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, anyway, uh, I'd have to go down uh, to the uh, workshop and, and reboot the uh, Raspberry Pi from here. But not, not to worry. Um, for the most part, this this process works really well um, and it allows you to monitor the print remotely um, there's a little uh, bird song that comes up uh, as a as a, uh, a little telltale when the when the prints finished which is really nice my kids hate it because it's usually so loud but anyway um, this I think is is a great way to run the printer um, and you know, very much so from the perspective that you're not running uh, a PC and using the printer as an additional screen, so you get out of all that, all those problems with screen savers, blah 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 blah, and you also don't have a PC that's tethered to the printer uh, that's there for for you know hours and hours and hours. Uh, not everybody's got a spare. PC uh, to do that kind of work. Okay, so there you have it. That's the One Howard D7 or Duplicator 7 uh, DLP printer. I hope you've enjoyed the, the video and got something out of it. Um, I'm really making this uh, for uh, new users just to give you an insight on uh, using the machine and you know the uh, uh, I guess I guess the limitations of the machine to a certain extent. Um, you know, you're not buying a Ferrari, you're buying, uh, you know, a VW Polo. <laughs> so don't, you know, get worked up about the whole thing. You're getting a machine that's capable of very, very good quality for what? How much did you pay? I paid about $500 US for the machine. Uh, so, hey, you can't complain. Um, you know, that's that's right there with, with budget uh, FDM printers. So. Yeah, I hope you've enjoyed it, and uh, don't forget to subscribe and like. Uh, Benny in the Shed's quite a new channel, and uh, I'd really appreciate uh, seeing some subscriptions and, and some likes come through. That would really encourage me to make more of this type of material. Alright, until next time, see you later.